Welcome to Discussions of Music, Healing, and Consciousness with your hosts, Chris Noble and Bill Perotsman. Today's episode is a freewheeling conversation about the part consciousness plays in both observer bias and intention. As it turned out, we related this to psilocybin journeying, since observer bias and intention have effects on everything from the growth of whole plant medicines to expectations for their use. While we aren't medical professionals, we are advocates for open eyes and hearts in the process, and we encourage you to find expert support for any purposeful psychedelic journey you want to take. We also explore the personal and communal experience of music, both standalone and with psychedelics, and offer some helpful pre- and post-trip encouragement and support. We'll be talking about all that and much, much more, as always, in these open conversations here on Discussions of Music, Healing, and Consciousness. I saw an interesting post on LinkedIn this morning, and I thought, hey, this could be a topic. The post was making the point that observer bias can affect the outcome of a particularly a psilocybin trip, but a psychedelic experience. And Hmm. I know we say in science, we try to eliminate all the observer bias, you know, and try to make things as unbiased as possible. But don't you want bias if you're in it to win it? (laughs) It's like law of attraction and all of that. And uh, I thought, hey, you know, that's probably a worthy conversation here. Yeah, I mean, I I want to hear more about this. Um, well, that's like, w- all I've got. <laughs> I so, mean, the post is, uh, Eric Osborne commented at length. He's like, "Well, this and that, you know, and when we're doing this and whatever." And um, he made the observation, which I, from my upbringing, my religious upbringing, I understand is how your thoughts or your presence influences the other person. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's why certain people just can't be healers. <laughs> Well, I mean, we know this with quantum physics too. There you go. Uh, the double slit experiment literally proves that the observer has complete manipulation over the outcome. In a sense, um, the particle would be remain a particle, but if it's observed, it becomes a wave, or yeah. vice versa. Yeah. And so, I mean, we kn- we've known this since I think the '40s or '50s. Yeah, it's old. And then, and then we had the placebo effect, which is also very, very old, and it's constantly ignored, but still has to come up in uh, stats. And I was just, I, I just laugh at sometimes the amount of statistics where the placebo effect and the actual drug itself that they're trying to test against are the same benefit. Like the, oh, this works for sixty percent of patients, and so did the placebo effect. For, so I'm like, what the hell's the better treatment here, guys? Exactly. <laughs> and you've heard of homeopathy, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, you can still get that stuff at you know our local health food store. Uh, refresh my memory, actually, homeo. So now so, that you mention it, um, if there's a let's say there's a molecule that's really good for us, or a substance like uh, essential oil, something like that. But okay. the benefits of that thing can still be can still occur when it is attenuated to like hundreds of thousands of its original concentration. Hmm. So if you take one part per million. And that's your base. You can attenuate that to like 0.001 parts per million. It has the same effect. Wow. So the and dosage it, almost doesn't matter. Is what it doesn't matter. It's the expectation. Oh, interesting. So this is why, you know, snake oil works and <laughs> all of that. Yeah, but then the other side of that is like I didn't knowingly eat a kind of epic – godlike dose of mushrooms once and i got really high and i didn't expect to get that high so the dosage did play a part you know to kind of like i know this is not probably black and white anyway there's i'm sure there's a lot of gray and nuances with this theory but um, i've had many circumstances where the dose definitely played a part and I, i don't recall having any preconceived ideas of what it was supposed to do right so you know what i mean so like i can think of exceptions to that but of course, I know that when you go into anything with preconceived ideas, they absolutely play a pretty major role, depending on especially on how uh, heavy those beliefs are or those um, viewpoints are. Because I would say even in science, a lot of things are beliefs. They're not like most of what we have as scientific fact changes. 
So when you really think about it, is it a fact or is it more just a belief that we're all choosing to believe for right now in history and then a hundred years later, it'll be thrown out the window? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And then there's this all. So in your solo mushroom experience, had there been another person around as vulnerable as you were, the argument goes, that other person without saying anything or without you even being aware that they were there could have affected your experience. Well, and I'm curious to see what they say, why they say that's the case. Is it because of the, I'm thinking on a physical level, like are um, the sort of what you want to call uh, electromagnetic um, auras or, you know, toroidal right. fields that right. our bodies yeah. emit, right? That we know and we've measured and they absolutely, that's why when you like someone, you say, oh, I got a good vibe or vibration from their energy, from their field. If I didn't like them, I got a really bad vibe or vibration from their from their field. And it's literally a, a frequency that gives our intuition or our other senses that we still don't maybe know we have even. Um, they, they tell us, yeah, bad news, stay away from that person. Or right, right. great news, go right up to that person and start a conversation. They seem really great. Um, is that the same, is that the same effect? Is it that if that person's in the general vicinity, even if the mushroom taker or a psilocybin experiencer doesn't know they're there, is it that that's influencing? Is it like human energy that plays a role or is it something more psychic, like a consciousness thing? Yeah. These are great questions that we need, you know, somebody needs to sort this stuff out because uh, from my experience, personal experience, and from the experience of other people who were in the church that I grew up in, instantaneous healing, even physical healing, is a thing. Yeah. And how does that work? Right. And it can happen for you individually by yourself, or you can find a practitioner to heal you. You know, at, at, either way, same result. And then there's the whole thing about communal stuff, like people who do mushrooms as a community. Um, experience, generally speaking, the expected results of the community doing mushrooms, right? You've got outliers mm. every so often. You've got somebody who's like, you know, purging or whatever. But generally speaking, you do it as a community because the community is there to support you. You're there to support the community. Generally, that lifts all the boats, you know, and, and you get a good result that way. I mean, I've also heard <clears throat> the compound effect of when you get multiple people together to meditate, I experience it every week when I go do breath work with my friends at the beach. We all meet up, sometimes just two of us, sometimes four or five of us, sometimes sometimes even more. And uh, the more people usually there, honestly, the more powerful. Like I do the same breath work. I mean, little variations, but uh, not enough to make a huge difference. And it's yeah. just like it's the people that I'm with. Um, you can have all these wonderful experiences on your own, of course, but – yeah, we know that that gets uh, compounded quite a lot. And you can, uh, it's, it's again, that same comparison of going to a concert versus listening to the same song oh, uh, right, yeah. at home. At home. You know, and, and again, you can have great experiences, but they're different. And when you're with people, they tend, people tend to augment whatever the situation. I mean, there's the, the monks that meditated in Washington, D.C. when crime plummeted for those weeks that they were there. Uh, but there was a group of monks. It wasn't just one. It was a group of them. Group, and so yeah. is that why they had such a, there are already powerful people with, you know, really high frequencies, um, but then they're together. So there's like a harmony or a harmonization that happens where it's just like everything gets exponentially amplified. So is that what's going on too? And I don't know. Is it, is it necessary? Is it essential? I mean, we know in the, in the terrible metaphor, but we know if we had, you know, one violinist on stage, you wouldn't hear as well as if we had two. Yeah. And if we had a hundred, you'd hear a lot better, right? So it's the augmenting of the, uh, not of the decibel level, the decibel level is going to be the same, but the energy behind it to carry it further, you know, is, is there when you have more players making the same sounds. I wonder if it's related in some weird way to how sound works, you know, and sound pressure. Yeah, because I'm like... Was going back to the study for a sec, were they saying that so basically not only was it the dosage and, you know, maybe the type of medicine you're doing for psychedelics that plays a role, but it's also the people involved with you in that? Is that what, is that what they're really saying was like, like, what was yeah. the, uh, 
Is so that what they're going for? Not a study. To be fair, it was a LinkedIn post, but it was a conversation. And the conversation uh, wound right. up touching a guy who has some knowledge in this area. And his basic point was uh, intentions matter, obviously. So the more players that come to the stage with the same intention, essentially, um, the more profound the effect could be. Mm. And obviously, if you're showing up and your intention is the opposite of the rest of the people in the orchestra, to use that analogy, um, it's going to mess things up for the majority of the people, perhaps for all of them, and certainly for the listeners. You know, what in the, who's playing that sound? You know, that guy right. doesn't belong. Why is he here with his timpani? <laughs> right. You know, when, what we want here is this violin melody. Mm. So, um, I mean, it bears, it bears, I think, some thought. Because if you are someone who, like me, was considering doing mushrooms for the first time, um, intentions matter. So how do I structure my own preparation so that I'm ready for that? How much of it do I turn over to the guides? How much do I sort of keep to myself? How much anticipation, expectation do I need to have if I'm going into a very vulnerable space where intentions that are not close to my surface might bubble up and become more powerful, you know, in a way? Yeah, I mean, so just, uh, I, I, is this answering or getting close to the question? It's kind of a it's a great question, Chris. You know? Yeah. Well, you know, it makes me think, Bill. Like, it's a great point that you brought up. You know, I think we should touch on this a little bit. You know, so let's say you haven't done mushrooms yet, or you haven't done a particular psychedelic yet. I've yet to I've yet to still do uh, acid or LSD, which um, I think I've done a good amount of the other ones, but that one I haven't, or or ayahuasca as well. Uh, but anyway, um, so there's actually quite a few I have. So this applies to me as well when I'm going to go into a new um, experience, basically. And, you know, a lot of things matter. What, one thing that I really try to do is actually take away as many of the preconceived ideas as I can about what it's going to do for me. Agreed, yes. Um, now, if I'm going in with the sole intention of healing something really specific, let's say a childhood trauma or an addiction, like lots of people do with the ayahuasca, for example, like I just want to quit smoking, <laughs> you know, let's just use that as an yeah. example, Yeah. then that makes sense to go in with a really clear intention. Um, and I would say you're probably going to have a reasonably successful experience, you know, unless your addiction to smoking is actually related and connected to something completely different. And in that case, the, the medicine might bring that about. And you're like, oh, oh, it's not smoking that's the issue. It's bleh, something else, perhaps, I, maybe. So, yeah, th this is a really important point. So um, I, I think what you're suggesting is completely aligned with the work that Gabor Mate has done up your way, where it's not really the addictive substance. There's something else below that that – of which the addiction is a symptom. Exactly. So if you can get to the thing that's below that, and oftentimes from what I understand, sometimes confronting those things that are below the, you know, the obvious, my desire is to stop smoking. Confronting what's below that can often be terrifying. Well, usually it is, to be honest. This isn't easy work in going into the depths of the darkest shadows of our being and our psyche and our... Yeah, or really our consciousness is, uh, from my personal experience, it's the hardest possible work I think you could ever do. <laughs> yes. It's, uh, it really is. It's everything but comfortable. It's uh, extremely vulnerable in terms of where you really, it strips away a lot of all of the um, kind of shields that we hide behind without even knowing, um, not to anyone's fault or anything, because we don't even know we're doing it. And so these psychedelics are amazing at just like kind of lifting the veil of of our <laughs> waking reality and how we present ourselves to even ourselves and our, you know, the rest of the world. And it can be quite, um, you can feel very naked, you know, uh, and you can feel very seen <laughs> yes. in a lot of senses. And, and I mean, like you're seeing yourself in a new way and it can be very uncomfortable. Um, but that's not to mistake that feeling with a quote unquote bad trip, which I know I have done uh, in the past. It all was a terrible trip. Was it, or was it just showing me something that was deeply uncomfortable, but it was the truth. And um, so the reason why I also try to, you can have an intention. That's fine. That's usually important, but to go in with an idea of the specifics of how it's going to go, how it's going to be, 
what uh, I even expect to feel like or see happen, feel happen. I try to throw all that out the window because my experiences, especially the best trips that I've ever had or the most successful, have always been nothing ever what I expected them to be. Um, and I really yeah. now know that I got to get that idea out the, out of my head if I want to have a good, successful, fun, uh, maybe not fun is not a, the right word, but a successful, let's say, experience. I got to get these ideas of what it should be or could be or will be wet, well out of my head. And intention's okay, but the expectations, I think, are what can be a little dicey because then it makes it really easy for you to be like, oh, this is what I expected. I'm like, well, yeah. No, duh, it's probably never going to be <laughs> what you expect. And that's the whole point of it, right? I, I'm going to be very gracious here because if someone has a psychedelic experience that cures their addiction, for example, um, I don't really care how that happened. I, I be, I'm curious and I would like to know, you know, if I could talk to the person, I would love, I would love to, to sort of get their story about that. But the fact that there's one less addict in the world is beautiful. To me, yeah. you know, hooray, however that happened, let's celebrate, <laughs> right? And certainly for the person who's had the relief from an addiction that's like wrecking your life, uh, what, a, what a blessing. Yeah. Can't argue with that. But I'm not so sure that what I, <sighs> there's like awareness and expectation and stuff that we talk about sort of in a spiritual sense. And then there's clinical protocol. Like, this is the protocol that will cure your addiction from smoking. Right. You know, it's like X grams of psilocybin, blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't know if that sets us up for success or not, although it's it's not bad. I mean, it's something, right? It's, a, it's moving in the right direction here. So it's like both and, right? If somebody's not ready to do the deep spiritual work and their, their addiction to cigarette smoking is cured for whatever period of time, maybe a lifetime, hooray, celebrate. Yeah, you know, and if they are ready for a deeper spiritual dive, and that kind of stuff comes up, and it's part of the whole process, even if it results in a less than blissful trip, is that so bad? No, and like you said before, dosage is such a again. And for the record, all those listening, Bill and myself are musicians. We're not, you know, yeah, we're not professionals. Here. We're not recommending. Big anything. disclaimer here. We're just we're, we're just really. <laughs> passionate about these things and we do our our own research like everyone should with any of these things especially before going into a psychedelic experience treat it like you're going into surgery or something like you prepare your body before you go into surgery at least you're supposed to you know you don't like have any alcohol 24 hours before and 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 particular foods perhaps you avoid and whatnot same exact thing goes into a proper uh psychedelic experience now it doesn't yeah. again have to but if you're going in to go through a ceremony, to have a, 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 a very, let's call it a therapeutic, medicinal type of psychedelic experience, then prepare for it, you know, like yeah. prepare your body. Some people, and I've heard this from a lot of people, do uh, fasting before as well. And they'll fast maybe for a couple of days. I've, I've, I've heard that a three-day fast before ayahuasca is actually a really great way to avoid the... Um, vomiting and diarrhea that usually happens with uh, with that type of psychedelic um, mushrooms is more of a stomach thing lots of ways to avoid that just by taking it as a tea uh, not actually digesting the mushroom component you're just taking the psilocybin out through a tea i find that to be great especially with lemon and ginger uh, also tastes a hell of a lot better i hate the taste of mushrooms the the, the magic ones um, and then it comes into, of course, like with anything, what type of mushroom? And, the, and that's another misconception with psychedelic mushrooms. There's not just one. There's actually a ton. Just like with weed, there's different strains of cannabis. Well, yeah. the same goes for mushrooms. I was actually on a, a farm out on Vancouver Island this summer that was growing medicinal and edible mushrooms for the government. And I uh, took a look at, I think, just four of the strains out of, out of I think, hundreds, literally. Um, certainly tens of them, um, but I think over a hundred strains for specifically magic mushrooms. There's literally millions of strains of, of mushroom and fungi, as we know from uh, a lot of different things, including the Fantastic Fungi documentary on um, Netflix, which everyone should check out at some point. It's fantastic. Um, but it depends on the strain, depends on your body type, depends on how much 
uh, experience you've had doing it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, going back to the idea of like having, uh, you know, good old Western medicine approach of, okay, well, this dose will work for this, for, you know, for adults and this dose will be for kids or whatever. I don't think that's going to work uh, nearly as well with psychedelics. It's going to have to be a lot more based on the individual and uh, and we'll see how it gets rolled out. But also, like you said, at least it's happening. Yes, at least it's people are doing something Thank God. better, better, yeah. right? Yeah, and the more that we can. Um, so as, as we're talking about this, intention matters. Um, I wonder about the intention of the mushroom itself as an organism. Uh, we hear a lot about how psilocybin based compounds are being synthesized and psychedelic compounds are being synthesized and they have effects, no doubt. But if we are considering observer bias, we also have to consider the manufacturer bias, perhaps. Great point, Bill. Right? So if you're uh, involved in growing medicinal mushrooms, edible mushrooms, if you're involved in growing anything and you've tried it before, you're going to know that your ability to grow plants <laughs> has a lot to do with the attitude and care that you bring to it. And plants really do respond. I know there's science on this now. They even respond to music. Yeah. You know, so, um, so do mushrooms. And we haven't really focused as a human society on mushrooms before, and now we're focusing on them hugely. I wonder what our societal, this giant ball of attention is now that's focused on fabulous fungi for the first time in history, it widely is doing to our mushroom crop, <laughs> right? Well, it's a, it's a great point. And I would say first time we've focused on it in modern history, yes, I'm sure the ancients, uh, you know, the Mayans, Egyptians, et cetera, certainly the Mayans because of the Amazon and everything, they very well aware um, of, of these medicinal compounds. But um, anyway, I mean, it's, it is really interesting as well to think about yeah, to think about how, well, you know, the intention of the makers, the manufacturers, because, you know, I've experienced this with cannabis too. There is a huge, and I've experienced this with, with mushrooms as well. There really is, a, I, in my opinion, a noticeable difference of where, well, it's like food for crying out loud, oh, like, yeah, especially nowadays, like, like or where are you grown? getting your food? Like when you eat... A, a tomato that you grew in your own backyard or your neighbor did and they traded you that for your Brussels sprouts or whatever the heck you're, you're, you're growing, which is the way that we should be running our, our local you know economies and everything like that. But anyway, it tastes like real food for, for one. Yes. It's the best tasting tomato you'll ever have. Don't matter what fancy restaurant you go to or, or fancy grocery store you'll go to, you will never get better than the own the thing that you can grow yourself, especially if it's easy stuff to grow. Um, and, and the same goes for these magical uh, mushrooms for cannabis. Now, th they take a lot more time and care. I have friends that grow both of them. I've seen the process. It is I don't do it for a reason. <laughs> it's like extraordinarily time consuming. Uh, it is a labor of love for sure. And some people love doing it and all the power to them. And I've had the mushrooms that I grew up um, taking, the magic mushrooms that I grew up taking my first trips uh, and pretty much all the trips throughout my 20s were all the same mushrooms from my one of my best oldest friends who grew them and would come home from work and sing to them and like yeah, loved, yeah. loved these mushrooms deeply, had a relationship with them. And I've had store-bought ones and had good experiences, but they weren't, they didn't feel as warm and fuzzy or as as like nurturing in a way as the ones that he grew because he put everything all of his love into them and all these places you know they have to meet consumer um, numbers and they're commercial and they're more mass produced and they will not get that time in and that uh, love that other you know it goes into my girlfriend runs cacao ceremonies and and uh and she sources this cacao from a very specific place in South America that actually blesses and gives uh, prayer and gives um, their own intention and love and other, you know, in, whatnot, like energetic powers and, and energy into the cacao. And it's basically like goes through its own ceremony as it's being created. And 
it's the best cacao I've had. It, a lot of everyone that uses it from her end who are pretty into the spiritual medicine, the, the, the medicinal qualities of cacao come back to her specifically for that cacao because of the way in which it is manufactured with that intention. So yeah, I think that is, is hugely important. We're at a point now in history where you actually might, depending on the state you live in or the country you live in, um, have access to more than one type of magic mushroom. Sure. And if that is the case, and if you know people that grow it versus, you know, is it going to be like Bob next door is growing them and that's automatically better than the dispensary? Not necessarily, right? Do you know his process? Do you know if he's given them love? I don't know. <laughs> so, it, it, but it matters. Uh, from my experience, it totally matters. Completely matters. And this is a, it's great that we're getting this awareness now, you know. Uh, there was a time where, Pot from the Golden Triangle in California was the best in the world, right? And there's a reason why generations of families lived there and farmed cannabis when it was illegal to do so uh, with the kind of care and protection and everything else that they brought to that enterprise. Um, I hope those people are now growing mushrooms <laughs> because the cannabis industry in California has been, you know, bureaucratized. And the stuff that you get at the dispensary, by and large, is crap. You know what it is? Uh, and I've actually already started to move slightly back to go, getting – It's there's a pattern here we're seeing, right? Going local mm -hmm. and getting the real organic stuff. Almost anything now in a dispensary for cannabis is not organic. Um, and there's uh, – you pay for it in different ways yeah. that you can't even – you don't even know until – excuse me, until you experience a local – truly organic piece of cannabis or yeah. magic mushroom. And then you're like, oh my God. Yeah. This is a huge difference. Just like when you bite into that tomato from a backyard versus the store down the street. So, and you know, if you like tomatoes, great, go for it because we can grow better tomatoes now than we could probably at any time in history on the organic farm, on the commercial farm. That's all great. But the nutritional value Yes. You know, of a homegrown tomato is far and away different than the, than anything else. And it's not just because you grew it yourself and brought your intention to it, although I think that's part of it. Definitely. But it's to, it's something to be aware of. And if you're preparing, for example, to take mushrooms for the first time or do any other kind of a psychedelic journey, an intentional psychedelic journey, it, it's a good question to ask. You know, in addition to the practical things like fasting and the other stuff that you were talking about, Chris, this is a this is a very beautiful substance. Oh yeah, that's been around. Not something that was manufactured and okay LSD. That's great. I mean, we've been able to synthesize some pretty cool chemicals. Yeah. Have you heard about uh, what is it? Two CB, the sex drug. No, What's synthesized that? chemical, right? So it's it's <laughs> like it, it has all the benefits of ecstasy without the hangover, right? <laughs> oh, interesting. But yeah, I mean, we've got others. Um, DMT, there's a bunch of different versions of that now. Yes. Synthesized chemical. It's the same kind of a trip, but last 15 minutes. You know, yeah. It's like the businessman's yeah. high. So, uh, <laughs> you know, great, cool, if they help. But um, I'm, I'm advocating for whole plant medicines here, but also for everything that goes into making a whole plant medicine beautiful, including yeah. the intention that you as a user bring to it and that the grower brought to its production on your behalf. You know? Oh, and without getting into a completely other topic here, I mean, that, that is a big thing is, like you said, w cannabis was grown by all the lovers of cannabis and local people and families while it was, you know, ridiculously made illegal for decades. And then the second it's legal, of course, it gets gobbled up by the corporations and now has lost all of its, you know, integrity and all of its value and nutrition as you could use it as a, as a word that would imply, as we both know, like you, again, you go back to somebody who's grown it, you know, locally and you're like, yeah, this is a million times better. It's also not going to have all the pesticides, like all right. the new stuff has. We have to go through that whole song and dance again with this industry and mushrooms will be the same. There's, you know, it, it will, it's going to happen because that's the system that we all live in. Um, so it's something to be aware, but that's also that awareness will help change these patterns from continuously getting gobbled up and then taken into a much less beneficial direction by, yeah. you know, the, the large corporations. Diluted in a way is what Very I Very diluted. Think of it. You know, it's like that homeopathy thing we were talking about. It's still there, but all of the, 
I, all of the non-scientific measurable stuff is as much a part of the substance as the measurable scientific stuff. Yeah, I mean, just look into Dr. Emoto's, you know, hidden messages of water for yes, any anyone who's skeptical of that, and and you know, be as skeptical as you want. It's important to be skeptical, but go in and look into this research by Dr. Emoto, and you'll see that the water crystals that he f photographed after receiving just different types of emotion, like love or versus anger, were dramatically different. This, these are the molecules that make up water, meaning water listens to how you feel. And it responds accordingly. And if it's responding accordingly, if you're giving water a lot of hate and anger because you're angry and hateful at life or yourself or whatever, then that water is literally going to become less nutritional for you and will become, in effect, kind of dead water without life giving properties. Um, versus the opposite, you give your water love and appreciation and gratitude, it will respond accordingly. This isn't just hippy dippy new age crap. This is like, again, science that's been photographed, documented and, and, uh, you know, beneficial types of music versus, you know, angry types of music, et cetera, et cetera. It's been proven even just writ writing down a word, not even saying it or thinking it, writing it down and then putting it on the glass of water that's being studied. But not just that, the only way that it had an effect was if the words were turned inward to face the water. Like, that's how specific this gets because it, because it matters, because, you know, it does respond and everything's made of water. Everything has a, an element of H2O in it. We're 73% water. This planet's, what, close to 70% water, just like we are. Um, we're mostly on a water planet here. I mean, everything is water. All of our food has water. So it's like, you know, the, the mushrooms that you're consuming in, in your, even though they've been dried out, they had water in them. And, uh, and I think this goes far beyond water. We just have only studied water, but it's all the molecules, all the things that make up matter respond to how we feel and how we think. So you're absolutely right, Bill. Of course it matters, arguably. And maybe one day we'll be able to scientifically prove this. It matters way more than the physical stuff, probably. Which, which, even if we're getting good results in the physical stuff, I just want to say there's better. There's more. Yeah. Right. There's there's usually more to everything when we think we're done. Right. Well, we can get into really crazy, like I, just really briefly. Like I was looking into Dolores Cannon, and Dolores Cannon has some really interesting. For those who don't know, she basically worked as a hypnotist for many decades and the regressions that she brought her clients through were pretty incredible into giving light into a lot of ancient uh, history and you know myths like Atlantis, people that experienced lifetimes in Atlantis and all these really fascinating things, ancient Egypt, etc. cetera, um, but also could talk about their lifetimes as extraterrestrials and other bodies that lived elsewhere in the, you know, the, the universe. And so she's, she's got an amazing, amazing vast array of knowledge that she has acquired through all these hypnotic regressions over many, many decades where she can, she can find commonalities like any good scientist and start to put the puzzle pieces together. She's got lots and lots of books out there. You can check her out. But basically she was also talking about how, um, you know, once again, how everything responds to how we think and how we feel. And, you know, th that this is actually used to be understood quite commonly among yeah, people. Yeah, it was sort of common knowledge. This really was common knowledge, just like how we're talking about like, hey, psilocybin mushrooms are kind of cool, right? Like, they, hey, they kind of sort of help. This would be the most hilarious no-brainer to a lot of these ancient cultures who are like, yeah, that's like the foremost, one of the biggest parts of our medical, you know, industry, or or maybe they wouldn't be really considered an industry back then. Maybe it would be just a a part of uh, health in general. Maybe they don't have categories like that, or maybe they didn't commercialize everything like we do today. But either either way, this was common knowledge. I mean, the ancients even have depictions of um, of lots of psychedelic uh, drug use that you can interpret. A lot of these, even cave drawings, have been. Um, uh, kind of correlated to different uh, psychedelic trips that a lot of um, anthropologists even think that we got at least boosts in our evolution specifically from digesting psychedelic plants for that matter. Nice. So, I mean, this just keeps going on and on and on. But basically, you know, it, it, it is, it's just all about the intention. And I think, I'm sure, 
yeah, we'll be moving into spaces more and more and more where that becomes um, accepted even by the most conservative science. Do you think that even something as sort of important but not yet completely measurable as observer bias is actually the uh, the practice of the paradox now and not yet both and mm. like observer bias can skew an experiment but what if you want the beneficial result of that experiment right right um is, is that so bad i i don't i don't think i think you're right i think it's it kind of goes back to the intention and like how it's used if you work that to your advantage why the heck couldn't it not why couldn't it work and a bit of also, I just wanted to backtrack for a second because I remembered why I brought up Dolores Cannon in the first place. It wasn't just for that point. It was also because she's done a lot, a lot of interesting uh, healings for people who have got, like, let's say a physical injury. And she goes and into a regression hypnotherapy with them. They go back to a lifetime in Atlantis, for example, and heal this trauma from this lifetime. It sounds like complete hogwash or whatever term you want to throw it sounds outlandish but she has so many documented reports of these people coming back and be like oh my scoliosis like went away my my leg pain that i've had for decades just vanished over the weekend um my my girlfriend who does bioenergy healing which is like a form of reiki but more a little different and uses like the uh like we were talking about before the electromagnetic uh, sphere or the toroidal energy field that inhabits and, and circulates all humans and the planet and probably most life forms. Um, she interacts with that in her in her treatment, and she doesn't physically touch you at all. And um, yet, she the reason she even got into it, she was a scientist who studied um, who studied um, what is what the heck was it? Um, she studied. Um, not, not nutrition, but uh, environmental toxicology. There it is. And so she was in a very science-based um, lifestyle at that point and had these crippling knee injuries for many years. She was on crutches for a long, long time, tried all these modalities in Western medicine. None of them worked. All of her doctors said she couldn't walk again. She wouldn't be walking properly. She'd be using crutches her whole life. And she was in her 20s when this was all happening. And then she discovered bioenergy, went to a week a weekend workshop and came out of it holding her crutches, not eating them anymore and hasn't looked back since over one weekend. So again, when you talk about miracle sort of healings happening in your church and people usually, at least in my upbringing that was not religious, would look at those things and go, ha, what a load of BS. That's so silly. Look at those silly people thinking that they're all healed. And meanwhile, but <laughs> the joke's on them because they are healed and they did get incredible um, things just from believing it, right? Just from and being in a room with people that believe that that is still to this day extremely, extremely powerful. So there is credibility to to that, and there's just so much that we still don't understand about health, about our bodies, and a million other things that you know affect them, right? Exactly, and uh, yeah, Dolores Cannon is worth a read. I'll put a link or something in the show notes so people can find her work. It's it's outstanding. Yeah, it's fascinating. And yeah. It's you can read it and go, oh, this is never pop, but you can read it, right? It's, these are actual documents. So there's that, there's the work that's happening in what used to be called thought field therapy, tapping, which is now oh, called emotional yeah. field therapy. Nobody really understands how that stuff works, but you know, acupuncture, acupressure points and whatever, but it's energy moving work, right? Yes. Yeah. And then there's network spiral analysis through the chiropractic system where um, I got to observe an NSA session once where the chiropractor was in a room clinic with six or seven people on tables and he was literally dancing around each of the people, right? No touch involved. And, um, you know, energy is a moving, right? And, and, and people look at that. I know, I know yeah, this, they is, go, this well, was this me is, in the past. This is crazy, right? <laughs> I used to think the same stuff. I, I can fully understand where people are at when they go like, this literally looks like insanity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You look like you're nuts dancing yeah. around people. You really think that's going to work? That's ridiculous. And it does. And, you know, and results. So I don't know if the expectation brings the results or if that, you know, some combination of all of it is having an effect. And when you get a good effect, I mean, how can you argue with that? I agree, right? It's it's a it's a little bit of both because there is there is definitely something to the energy side of life where we know that there's so much that we can't see, 
or feel or taste, hear, touch, whatever, but it's there. We know it's there. We have instruments that can measure it, and sometimes we don't, but there's just so much more to this reality that yeah. we literally cannot see. We're looking at probably 1% of what's really going on around us, including our own bodies, including our own um, how we are as living beings. We're not just these meat sacks. We are light. We're literally light encapsulated in matter. And, you know, what does that actually look like on a frequency level? I mean, if you just had your third eye open up a little bit more, your pineal gland open up a little bit more, you'd probably be able to intake more of this information. You might see what some people can see, which is energy. And some people can see that and that's how they're able to interact with it in the way that they do. Um, some people feel it much like you would feel like the wind blowing on your, your arm. They can feel that same sort of sensation, but it's energy. Uh, some people will get visions where they're like, oh, I'm seeing all this stuff in my mind's eye. So I'm almost, almost like a psychic uh, ability to be able to tap into these energies, these frequencies, but they're there, you know, and we're just getting better with acknowledging that they could very well be there. And then how do we interact with them, right? I'm going to step into music for a second here because, you know, all consciousness is welcome. If the consciousness that you're at is like a psilocybin trip will cure my smoking addiction, fantastic. If the consciousness that you're at is a psilocybin trip will put me in touch with astral beings, fine, cool. You know, just all levels welcome. But guess what you can do to bring all those levels of consciousness together at one moment in time? Make music. Yeah. <laughs> and when you're making music, it just, all of the toroidal auras that we, you know, all emanate all the time or however you want to interpret it all come together. There's a unified field around the shared experience of music that is so beautiful. And uh, we do that all the time without even thinking about it. We dance together, we sing together, we experience, we go to concerts together. I mean, even in this stuff shirt sort of classical music environment, you can still see that people are all there with some kind of an intention together. And that powerful group intention is a great way of being able to uh, be safely vulnerable and open up to whatever the information is, whatever the emotional content is, whatever the experience is that music has for you in the presence of other people as well who are doing the same. And, and that's really what we want right now. Mm. You know, we don't want to divide ourselves anymore. We're already divided enough. It's truly. And and I don't know if you've noticed this, but there's like an explosion of books out there about forgiveness and grace and how to deal with trauma. It's like in the last 20 years or so, the world's gone nuts on how do we deal with the tough stuff in life. Instead and, of just discard it and drink it yeah, away. Yeah, instead of like, yeah, or positive toxic positivity, like ignoring it, stuffing it aside. Yeah. There's a welcome. Um, I don't say, it's probably not welcome is not the right word, but there's a, an understanding that suffering is a gateway now. Mm. That even maybe 10 years ago, people were still trying to push suffering under the rug. You know, I don't want to suffer. I don't have to do that. I can pray it away or whatever. You know, I can yeah. smoke it away. Whatever the, the, you know, the alternative was. But now it's like, oh, suffering? Okay, bring it on. Let's do that. I've got tools. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> right? a, once you get the tools, all of a sudden you realize suffering is massive insight coming your way. Incredible, and right? That's the beauty of suffering if you want to label it that. And because uh, it is difficult, so it feels like you are suffering. By I know, definition. I'm being careful with labels too, because, you know, there's a, uh, there's a th cancel label culture out there now. <laughs> oh, there's an everything cancel this whatever culture. But I mean, I, uh, I agree, like categories are also just another, you know, kind of problem. But while we still have them and still have the English language, I would say that suffering by that definition is uh, is becoming more and more understood. I mean, look at the Buddha, right? He was born yeah. into wealth and born into high culture, high society, and recognized that if there's if he was ever going to be able to get to the level of consciousness that he wanted to get to and the level of understanding that he wanted to get to as what it is to really be human, he had to suffer. So he had to do the equivalent of like credit, cutting up your credit cards and like, like kind of like Bruce Wayne went through and he did his, uh, you know, um, uh, awakening experience before he became Batman, uh, had to get rid of all the wealth, had to leave it all behind as, as much as he possibly even could and go into poverty, go into these darker 
shadows of society and of human you know life and existence just so that you could understand and learn and gain so much from those experiences and those were like catalysts for how he got to where he got to in his quite obviously pretty influential in a very positive way journey uh for the buddha so you know um suffering clearly is a part of life otherwise we wouldn't suffer i mean i don't think we experience anything we're not meant to experience and that's hard for a lot of people to hear especially for those who have had unimaginable suffering and i mean i we're not saying at all that that stuff is fine or that you should just suck it up it's like no there's many people out there that have horrific lives let's to be real um but going back to dolores cannon you know on a consciousness spirit level and this this is a tough pill to swallow but it's something that i i have come to really i find accept is that you know as souls we, you don't experience the pain that you experience when you come and you enter the body in this third dimensional reality you when you come into this body and into this life you have chosen already supposedly what you want to be doing and the type of life you want the kind of parents you have right yeah um all even up to how you die you get to choose all of this apparently this is just one fun virtual reality video game that we're in and even people like elon musk would agree with that and mathemat mathematicians every time they look at the universe are like who designed this because <laughs> it just it just reeks of, of created you know design like someone definitely put this together there's too yeah. much mathematical like equations and formulas coming out of this existence in life but um but yeah so if if we just take that to like let's just hypothetically say that we do have a choice as souls and spirits coming into our body Believe it or not, those people that are suffering to such extraordinary degrees have chosen that life to come in and suffer or to die as a as a as a young child or or an excruciating death as an adult in war or whatever the heck the case is where you could be like, how on earth would anyone in their right mind choose that kind of because as souls and as as consciousness, we actually don't have such a fine line between necessarily one good and evil and good and bad because there aren't bad experiences and there aren't good experiences there's only experiences yeah and yeah. so when you come in a soul that looks at a life of suffering goes oh wow look at all the learning i'm going to do in that lifetime sign me up for that horrific life <laughs> yeah and it sounds nuts but from all the stuff that i have heard in that that area it, it really does seem to be like it's all about learning and, and I don't think souls or consciousness cares what that even really looks like. Good point. Yeah. I'm, I guess I've always felt like I'm a lifelong student, a lifelong learner. Oh yeah. Me too. And I can't imagine saying, no, that's, that's it. I've had enough. I was thinking the other day about how much fun it would be to like really nail calculus this time <laughs> because so much of what's taking place in our scientific world is, is, founded on calculus. Calculus is like arithmetic now for the people who are thinking in that level of understanding. Mm. And I'm, I feel like I'm missing out, <laughs> you know, a little <laughs> bit. But um, yeah, so signs of a, uh, gosh, well, I almost said signs of an enlightened soul, but I don't think that that's the only thing that this is a sign of. But if you're curious and, and just chronically curious, um, I have a, a really good friend who the world would call is chronically homeless, but he believes that he's chronically free. Interesting. He's thinking about the very same things that you and me are thinking about, Chris, like from the street. Mm. And uh, these are things that light him up. How are we going to change this world? What do we have to do to make our um, to, to make the human race uh, sustainable? You know, what kinds of things would those be? And, and, and you know, this is a guy who doesn't know anything about calculus. But it's a it's like this infectious desire to to be a part of the moving forward, mm. you know. That's a beautiful thing. And I feel that coming from a lot more places. Maybe it's just because I'm older, or I just feel it coming from a lot more places than I used to. I think Are it's you? the time. I think I think it's just we're in a time where the earth and human race is rapidly evolving in uh, what you know, if you watch the news, you'd say we're deteriorating. But I would argue. No, no, that no, wait a minute. No, hold on. Let's time out just a second on this because this is important. The world record for riding in a pumpkin was <laughs> set <laughs> just last week. 
<laughs> well, then we're definitely on the up. <laughs> We've got to be in a good place right now, dude. Okay, I'm sorry what you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> so my point exactly, Bill. <laughs> if you look on the news, there's not a lot of hope right now. <laughs> Except for the odd fluff piece about winning pumpkin tournaments or exactly, something. Exactly, like riding in a pumpkin. Or yeah. chasing a cheese wheel downhill. Well, you know, all are important things. Yeah, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, like I would say most people would I know are pretty stressed about what's going on in the entire planet every day because yeah. it's always something new. And um, and it's not that those things aren't happening. But, man, I, I feel you on that sense where I'm like I've never met more people on a daily basis now, more and more and more. And these are strangers. These are people off the streets. These are not – people in my network and I just continually see a maturing of our species, um, a sense of actual, believe it or not, camaraderie among more people, actually less division, even though that seems to be the uh, agenda of many powers that be, um, continually trying to pit us against each other for new reasons all the time. And yet there's an increasing sense of uh, camaraderie for humans because the last two years we've all suffered collectively in our own ways but we've all gone through some form of hell in the last two years and i think we can all actually have a bit of um you know respect towards one another for having gone through that together and being like look i think we can all probably agree we just want a better world right right so maybe we should just you know let's just get better (laughs) well let's just get better and maybe maybe instead of trying to wait for something to happen outside of ourselves let's just start with ourselves because that's one thing, maybe the only thing I can actually control. I don't know if this is an appropriate question at this moment, but I completely agree with you. And I'm going to reframe what you just said in terms of observer bias. There must be a line somewhere where observer bias is on one side and intention is on the other. And once you cross that line into intention, I think, is the moment at which power comes your way. Mm. That's a good point. So rather than just sort of trying to stand back and separate yourself from the experiment or whatever, or if you're in the social sciences, to separate yourself from the data or you know try to account for all the things that could be accounted for, or even if you're a climatologist and you're trying to figure out what the hell is going to happen you know, with, with the earth warming up, um, why worry about observer bias if the intention that we all want is something better than what we have? Who cares? Yeah. I mean, we can futz around with observer bias when it makes sense. I don't know what that would be. You know, maybe a nuclear physicist or something. Sure. But if we if we want to go to Mars, we got to start with an intention and let the science follow that. You know, and if we want to make our world a better place, that's a pretty broad intention. Starting with that seems to be a much better thing than starting with fighting again about right. some stupid thing that doesn't matter and they you know, to the health of the world. And it not it lovely that those kinds of things are coming along, whether or not uh, the scientists will call that observer bias bias in a mushroom trip. Who cares if it's good? Yeah. If it's help, if it's helping people, especially if that's the desired effect, which it is for the most part with psychedelic uh, mushrooms or any kind of those, those uh, substances. Right. And and again, you know, with advisement, because, Chris and I can't sit here and tell you what to do. That's not our job. And But we can encourage you, right? And if we're encouraging your good intentions, then we're doing our job. That's all it is. And, you know, we've. I think we say this every single episode, which is, you know, always bring it back to yourself. Think for yourself. You know, going into the psychedelics uh, is a beautiful journey because it already is showing your, – you're showing yourself that you care enough – about your own development and your own improvement and your own healing that you're willing to take a, a journey into the unknown, right? And that's that's a huge leap of faith. And that that tells your body and yourself, which believe it or not, actually makes a huge impact because if you think about all the things that we're probably telling ourselves every day, and myself included, um, these are old stories and programs probably oh, sure, yeah. well back to childhood. All the that stuff are not, that's just spinning. Not, not the nicest, let's be honest. Not always yeah. the best um, stories or thoughts or belief systems that we're telling ourselves every day. So this is a nice change chance to reprogram and to show yourself that like, okay, you know, I'm going to try this thing and I'm going to do my research. I'll do the best I can to uh, set myself up for success. I'll take that leap of faith. 
I'll have the experience and then I'll go from there basically. But I'm doing it because I care about myself enough to try something that honestly seems to be statistically speaking and from all the anecdotal evidence too, seems to be really, really, really beneficial um, for so many different things. And, and ultimately just for the betterment of humanity, for the evolution of your own self and your psyche and your consciousness, because that's really what these plants are here to do is to evolve human consciousness. It's really what it, all, all that I find these things do are they peel away our restricted layers of, of ob yes. observation. Well said, Chris, exactly. That's really all that's going on. It might feel like a ton of stuff happening, but all that's actually really going on is it's actually bringing us back to our truer selves without all of yeah. the cognitive dissonance, as well as just physical layers of, I mean, for example, most water in North America has fluoride in it. Fluoride is actually calcifies the pineal gland in your brain. The pineal gland is what ancients would refer to as your third eye, and that's a chakra system, and that's a huge area apparently where you get to see and observe these higher dimensions and energy, all the things. So it's like, oh, I can't see these things. Well, there's a good reason why. One, because we we're taught since day one that those things don't exist. So if you don't believe something, b belief is everything. <laughs> it truly is, you know, if... Like if someone convinces you something, it is absolutely real in your reality. Um, and your body literally doesn't know the difference. That's what we know stress. Your body doesn't know the difference of you getting chased by a lion and you freaking out about missing work and traffic. It's the same chemical reaction. So anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting <laughs> road to go down with these, with these psychedelics. But it, it, I think just to bring it back, you know, like you're saying, it's, it's up to the individual and we really do give you guys, uh, you know, guys and gals listening to this podcast, uh, always bring it back to yourself, do your own research and, um, you know, and, and do what feels comfortable for you. You're going to be pushing your comfort zone, but don't go to such an extreme where, you know what I mean? You're completely out of any realm of comfort. These are, pretty powerful um, substances. And, you know, you do want to try to ease yourself into them. And because the last thing you want to do, for the most part, is to do what a lot of people have in the past, like myself included, and you just do an insane amount, have a ridiculous experience that you can't even comprehend. And um, although they were still life changing for me, uh, I really wish I was more cognizant of what I was doing in those times. So, you know, just like anything, um, temperance, respect for the medicine, respect for yourself, all those good things, just bring it into the equation. And I, I'm sure we, we trust that you'll have, uh, the, the experience that it was needed for you. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. If, and if that's your intention, <laughs> you're intending to have not a good, or just to have an insanely crazy experience of like astral traveling and, angels or beings coming to you and all that go for it i've had yeah. friends that have had that so sounds awesome <laughs> seriously right so yes uh you know yourself trust yourself trust your intuition on this this is an intuitive thing getting involved with whole plant medicine and and you're, you'll find your intuition is there for you it's it's actually going to serve you well yeah and there's nothing wrong with hopping on good old youtube and literally um, YouTubing or Googling people that have experienced what you're about to go do, hear from others, you know, and you'll get lots of useful tips. Uh, again, things like fasting before, all, all those kind of things, uh, and see what resonates with you and, and your body and your experience level and just go from there. I'm a big fan of having a guide for the first experience. Uh, I'm not sure that I do a first experience in a communal setting, although that might be different for anyone who's listening. That might be different for you. Uh, but I think having an experienced guide sort of helps form my intention more carefully than if I just sort of set a, an intention that's wide open. Definitely. So uh, maybe that's a, a friend who's had experience with uh, psychedelics and you can rely on that person to help you through. Uh, but the importance of being in safety. Yeah. Uh, 
and having comfort having a guide or a trip sitter with you to make sure that you don't do anything stupid <laughs> it's true you know, running it's really out of traffic true. is not a good idea even if you are you know like living on the astral plane today so uh yeah be be wise have fun uh, welcome the insight set the intention and even though we've been talking about it now for an hour the observer bias can work for you especially when it involves your own health and well-being right so Make it a good one, right? Well, that's why when you, you know, it's, it is important who's around you really matters. And, Definitely. Uh, yep. and that's a big one. It's your environment. Where are you doing this? A lot of people do like to be in nature. Um, although the best of both worlds is to have like a place that like a house or a cottage even would be the best and to be out in nature so you can walk out, be in nature, but then be immediately have amenities and comfort, right? You know, close by too. Uh, especially for your first time, mushrooms can make your physical body next to like like mashed potatoes, basically. Like you will not yep. want to move at all sometimes, depending on the trip. Sometimes you want to go climb a tree. So it really depends. But, um, you know, being places of comfort and people that are that you're comfortable around are so important. So Definitely. Important. Yeah. People you can trust who trust you as well. Yep. And you can get in your face if you start to act out. Yeah, can tell you the right thing to do, uh, basically, in that time and, and talk some sense into you lovingly. <laughs> lovingly, yes. What a wonderful experience we all get to have, you know, whether we're sitting for a trip or participating in it, to connect with each other at a level that is so much better than the day to day, you know, social media sniping that we. <sighs> You will connect in ways you'll, you can never imagine connection. And that's the other beautiful part of psychedelics is I was lucky to have them at such a young age where I knew what deep connection actually was yes. because of what I attained in those states of consciousness where you're like, oh, that's love. Right. Oh, that's connection. And like my love for nature, like I, I love nature like I love my grandmother, you know, like it's not just like, oh, it's pretty outside. Yay. It's like, no, there is a deep reverence and love because of psychedelics opened that up for me. And I, 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 I literally was connecting with a, with a being, with the consciousness of the planet. And that planet is so lovely. And she's just the most beautiful spirit I I love her very dearly, <laughs> and, you know, and like, and I can speak like that because I've literally had those connection experiences, of course, off of psychedelics, but psychedelics really helped get my brain trained Yes. to then, yes. To then experience that after the fact, sober, no problem. And there'll be many times where I'm like, well, I feel like I'm on mushrooms right now because I, because whatever's going on is so beautiful and spectacular and I feel so connected or the colors are more vibrant or whatever's going on. And it reminds me of a psychedelic trip because those trips really opened me up to be able to be like that more often and normal states of consciousness and, and sober, basically. I don't know if there's anything else we can add to this. This is, <laughs> this is just such a, it's turning into such a beautiful encouragement for people to expand the, the kind of love that you are capable of, 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 of offering already. Yes. Just to unlock yeah. that a little bit, even if it's a little bit, right? And, and, Expand the consciousness where as great as you are already expanded, there's more, right? There's always oh, more. Yeah. And anything that gets you to that place is much better than suffering. I mean, to be honest, even yeah. though we got to learn to do suffering well too. Yeah. You know? So I just want heroic journey. There's a bunch of them. Take my word for it. <laughs> yeah. I'm not the only one out there, but you know, what a great opportunity and invitation. And also um, what a joyous potential. If we can bring that into our observer bias, right? Let's set that intention, because you know why not? What do you want? More of the more of the same old, more suffering, Thanks. more of the grind. <laughs> when there's so much more available. Yep, and that's what we're moving into—a whole new world of incredible possibilities and opportunities. So, I think that's a great place to to end it, Bill. So, Amen, you know, brother. I think uh, happy tripping to those listening, and uh, just be safe and. And uh, be kind to yourself, you know, at the end of the day. Yes. What is that song? All there is is love. <laughs> all, um, and all you need is love. <laughs> all you need is love. And you have no idea. Yep. <laughs>
and for taking time to show your appreciation with a like, share, or subscribe. Discussions of Music, Healing, and Consciousness is a practice of spontaneity, and we welcome your comments, ideas, and questions. There are ways to connect with us in the show notes, so let us hear from you. Until next time, this is Bill Protzman along with Chris Noble wishing you great musical health. Samara Huchaya.